coming up next, an interview with one of history's only rock and roll singer-songwriters that's had a big hit in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s. Uh, in the late 70s, he needed a birthday present for his wife. So on the fly, he sat at the piano and wrote uh, a birthday song for her. Well, not a birthday song, but a song. The song was so good, his bandmates begged him to put it on their new album. He wasn't so sure about it, but at the last second, his bandmates got him to agree to it. Put a nice guitar solo on there. It became the band's first number one hit. One of the biggest songs of 1979. He tells us the story next. Also some insight on the band coming together and playing on it. It's next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Make sure to subscribe below to be part of a community that's dedicated to the timeless music of the rock era. Make sure to click on the bell so you never miss out on our, our daily content. We jump in the time machine every single day. Stories straight from the legends. We got some great interviews coming up. Check us out on Patreon as well. We have full interviews there and our merch. Both of these things help us keep it a daily channel. It's that time again. Excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations, our most popular program on this channel. It's where featured artists go deep on their greatest songs and their greatest albums. Today, we sit down with a legendary singer and songwriter that is in a very exclusive club, one of only a few rock front men to have a top three hit in three different decades. When Dennis DeYoung was with Sticks back in the day, he sang and wrote many hits, including a top three in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. To be exact, Babe went to number one in December of 1979, getting in there just before 1980. The Best of Times and Mr. Roboto both went to number three in 1981 and 1983, and Show Me The Way was a number three hit in 90. You know it's you, babe. Got Roboto, Domo. Show me the way. Pretty amazing. See if you can guess who the other lead singers from bands were that accomplished this in the comments. Let's have a good discussion below. Sticks was like a rocket in those days. I mean, they were releasing hit after hit after hit. They burst onto the scene with Lady, that of course came in 73, arguably the first power ballad ever. We covered that a few months ago. After a few more top 40 hits, they hit number eight with Come Sell Away. We have the story of both of those uh, from Dennis. After that, Blue Collar Man, Long Nights, and Renegade, both written by Tommy Shaw, were both top 25 hits. And as the 70s wrapped up, Styx released the album Cornerstone in October of 1979. It became the band's third straight multi-platinum album at that point. Uh, the album was propelled by their first single, Babe, written by Dennis DeYoung. Babe went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100 in the U.S. It also crossed over to the AC chart at number nine, as well as number one in Canada and South Africa. Went top 10 in the UK, New Zealand, Australia, and Ireland. So it was a global hit. Dennis tells us a very interesting story about how the song came to be and how it was recorded in our exclusive interview. It's really interesting how he recorded it too. You'll wanna to see this. He also tells us about his new album, 26 East, volume one and volume two. Great album, you can get both at the link below. Um, just a really amazing set. So here's Dennis DeYoung with the story. And actually, come to think of it in 1979, uh, they were one of just a few people that had a non-disco hit, so a few bands or artists in 1979. Pretty much, uh, I think like 95% of the number one hits from 1979 were disco, except for uh, a couple of bands. Let's talk about that in the comments as well. Whenever I get weary and I'm mad in love so here's Dennis DeYoung with the story, always an entertaining interview, one of the best storytellers out there. As we go into this, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, my favorite glasses ever. I'm wearing my blue ones. Got Professor Rock on the side. You can do the same thing. You know, Zenny, you can customize your eyewear with a prescription lens or a non-prescription lens if you just want the unique look or color or a particular style of lens. You can get sunglasses, reading glasses. You can add sunglasses to the pair you have. All you do is put in your prescription and uh, choose your style and they'll send them straight to your door and you can get it for up to 80% off regular retail prices. Click on the info button up here to get our best deal. Here's the interview. 
I remember Casey Kasem. That's when I started listening to the American Top 40, which was pretty much something that people my generation did weekly, you know, who loved pop music. I remember him announcing his number one song, still as clear as day. You know it's you, babe, whenever I get... Always love Babe. I just love the, the electric piano at the beginning. My wife, as all wives in rock and roll, they have to put up with a lot of, a lot of stuff. Particularly my wife, she married me when I was nobody. She supported me, she traveled with me on the road, raised our daughter on the road. Because after 76, I just didn't want to be on the road anymore by myself. Mentally, it was no good for me. I, I, I needed my, my, my wife there. I'll be lonely without you. I hated the constant coming and going, the separation was, uh, I'm not good at that stuff. With Babe and Lady, with Lady, you invented the power ballad. Lady, when you're with me, I'm smiling. You guys did it. They give you and Led Zeppelin, the, I've read a couple of articles. Did Led Zeppelin create the power ballad or did Sticks do it? But you did. And after that, pretty much every band out there, they would write two songs. They would have the rocker and they would have the power ballad. And, and that's how they would format yeah. everything in the 80s. So I just wanted to recognize that. I envy people who get such joy from performing. But I, you know, to me, it's, it's a challenge in perfection. I have to be, I want to be perfect. And live performance doesn't allow that. Babe, I believe in, I must be on my way. Earth is against it. Earth is absolutely perfection. As an inhabitant of Earth, I torture myself to be perfect, can't do it. And so I'm always, you know, left feeling I should have done better. I get off the road, and I had a terrible time in 1978 doing the pieces of a tour. I was really, didn't know it, but I was, I felt in a box. I had been making albums, I made eight albums in a row that were yeah, not identical, but similar in tone. And after I, um, I did pieces of it, I felt like I was running out of gas. I came home, my wife's birthday, I'll write her a song uh, for her birthday party and surprise her. So I just sat at the piano, wrote it in like a day and a half, done. The time is drawing near. I go into the studio. I call John and Chuck up. I said, let's go. I have to demo this. I'm going to give it to Suzanne. Okay. We're very close, our, the pronouncers and I. Family functions. We're always together. We go to the studio, and the engineer says, I'm sorry. The grand piano is out of tune. You're going to love this story from what you just said. I said, well, yeah, stupid. <laughs> what do you think I'm here? What am I going to play? Flute? In the corner of the studio, a guy named Bobby Whiteside had left his Fender Rhodes there. This is true. I said, I never played a Fender Rhodes. They're tricky. Wurlitzers, they're different kinds of instruments. So I said, bring it out. It's only a demo. And it's only for my wife. It's not for anybody else. It's not for you. You can't have it. So we roll it out. He rolls tape. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to and if it that home, but it all that noodling around. Tape was rolling. I hadn't thought it out. No singer there but me. I sang all the harmony parts. It's only for Suzanne. Doesn't matter. So please believe me. My heart is in your hand. No guitars because guitar players were on vacation. I take it home, reel to reel. I'm listening to it. I'm thinking, hmm, that thing sounds great. Babe, I love you. I play it for her. And then people hearing it at the parties, like 30 people. And my buddy Tom Short, uh, we're very close. He, um, he's, he's gone. But at the time, he loved his two favorite bands. Uh, Led Zeppelin, number one, Sticks. Why? This is something for the psychiatric community to get involved in. 
but he loved Led Zeppelin. But he could he could relate to love songs like you. There's some people who go, I, uh, uh, I can't hear that. It's a love song. It's too romantic. It's messy. It's cheesy. Explain to me how cheesy became a pejorative term. Everybody likes cheese. It's so true. Come up with something new. It's fungusy. No one wants a fungus. I digress. So anyway, Tom Short says, hey, that's, that's number one. I went, what? Yeah, that's a hit. So I played for the guys. We came in. We put Tommy put a solo on. We didn't even re-sing the vocals because people loved the demo so much. I was scared to death to change. You know it's you, babe, and because it was only for Suzanne, I didn't think it needed any guitars for that. And we ultimately, other than the solo, put no guitars on it. It was never intentional. It was never meant to be a stick song. Never. Just for her. And I went in there doing it like, eh, nobody's going to hear this. We'll give I should have done that more often. So that is the story of Babe. Let's talk about the new album, multi-volume collection, 26 East, which uh, was your address growing up in the Chicago area. So the band was formed in that basement, my mom and dad's house. The Nazo brothers lived across the street. Like we talked earlier, walked over, boom, let's, let's have a band. 26 East, I mean, many years of inspiration and curating went into this project. I mean, you had a lot of music in you that you wanted to share. And so the, the record is essentially, what is it? I'm 73, it's my life experiences, everything I can remember and tell you about how I feel about things, you know, because all I do was this. This is all I do. I find some chords in the piano. Then I find some notes that I like that go on those chords. Then I make up words that fit on the notes. And I give you, I give you my perspective on my personal life and the world at large, hoping that you will find yourself in my song, my story. That's it. That's what I do. And uh, if you get it right, they, they, they treat you pretty good. So that's what the album is. It's a combination of, you'll hear lots of sticks, references. And then I was in that band, as I recall. And then there's going to be some stuff that appeals to me. I think you've, you've interviewed Jim Peter, Kevin. Oh, yeah. Jim's great. Yeah, great guy. So it's just me and Peter Rick working together on half and me doing the other half. And the reviews have been so overwhelmingly um, complimentary. I, I have to thank Jim Peter for convincing me to do it. So if you like Sticks and or me, I'd say you, you, you could, I think you'd like this record. If you don't like me, don't get it because I'm all over the thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm on every song. Yeah, let's break down a few of the songs. The duet with Julian Lennon. How did that come about? And tell me about that song. To the good old days. Good old days when the world was new. So I went to the piano and I wrote a song, this song, to the good old days with he and I in mind. Okay. And then I just did a little demo and send it to him through his business manager. I don't know him. Never met him in my life. Just did the cold thing and that it's not going to respond. I had no hopes. And then he said he'd be honored to do it. We went to New York. We met. I mean, hello. He sang. I came back home. I finished it. I love it. It brings me incredible joy to hear it because um, his dad's band meant everything to me. So that's how that he, he hadn't been doing music. He hadn't done any for six or seven years. He just, I like, hey, I love the song. I'll do it. I think he's so underappreciated. I think Julian Lennon's great. So that's how that happened. Reminisce about Toast in the Good Old Days. Uh, I love that song. You also celebrate, though, the here and now and how we all came together and to good times in the future. And I think it's, uh, it's a great for song for these times. I didn't try to overdo it. I just played the song. I didn't try to make it so clever or not too beatly, although you know what, what's going on. Um, and I didn't overproduce it. I just said, let's let, let the lyric and the music speak for itself. Just we're going right through it. So hard to say goodbye. So I promise not to cry. It is my tendency to, to uh, you know, I don't make the big statement. But in this one, I just let it, let it happen. I love it. 
The video's cool. Check it out on YouTube, kids. Uh, to the good old days. It's all home movies from my life. See everybody's face in there? We all in there? Everyone smile. It shows uh, my family, my friends, the early band, um, the guy behind the Grand Illusion, the real guy, the one you're talking to today. East of Midnight, let's talk about that. Grandiose rocker, the orchestral instrumentation, soulful background, vocalist. East of midnight, I can hear the in stereo. Of course, that unmistakable, roaring, Dennis DeYoung vocal. Again, you're going to be humble like you always are, but your voice harkens to the Grand Illusion days in this song, I feel. It's, you still have that that uh, glorious voice that uh, I remember first hearing as a kid. A south side brick bungalow in a lifetime long ago. Originally written by John Melnick and Jim Peter. They did a demo, and when we started writing, I said, here's my demos, what do you like? Here's mine. Then we started putting songs together. And I heard it, and I said, I can <laughs> make that into a stick song. It's got all the elements, it just needs the three-part harmonies, We'll this over here, we'll pull the thing, we'll stick it there. I changed the lyric, make it more autobiographical to my life. Um, and it's East of Midnight, and I, I kept playing, and I thought, well, if you're looking for that thing, there it is. <laughs> right? There it is. So volume two. Yeah. What can we expect from volume two? Can you tell us a little bit about that? I had to, when I, when I finally realized there were going to be two of them, I didn't want to put everything great on one. I'm going to make sure that it's as good as, as I, can, I can give you, because that's the way I know how to do it. And then, you know, good night, Mrs. Calabash, wherever you are. And good night, Mrs. Calabash, wherever you are. We should get back together when two comes out. I've loved it. It's been everything I hoped it would be. So thank you so much for the music. I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Your songs have gotten me through some great times and some really crappy times. And uh, I just really appreciate it. It's been an honor. Thank you. I'll be missing you. Leave us a comment about this classic rock standard. What are your memories of this song, this power ballad about sticks, music of 79 going into 1980? Who are the other artists to have a top three hit in three different decades? Let's see if you can get that. Let us know in the comments. We'll have a great discussion. Click on the links below to get Dennis's new album, 26 East, both, both volumes. Came out a few years ago. Really good stuff. Um, and also, make sure to subscribe below to be part of our daily channel here. We'd love to have you. Until next time, three chords and the truth.